Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health On Call. Mindfulness is sometimes thought of as a self-help buzzword, but it's actually something that's key to our physical and emotional well-being. Today, I talk with mindfulness researcher, Dr. Christina Bethel, about the science behind the practice, its connection to resilience, and how mindfulness can help people recover from trauma and adverse childhood experiences. We also go over some basic mindfulness practices you can do yourself and walk through a breathing exercise together. Let's listen. Dr. Christina Bethel, thank you so much for joining us. Mindfulness is sometimes seen as a buzzword, but it's actually something that is really key to our physical and emotional well-being. How do you define mindfulness? Well, that's a really good question. And there's a lot of buzzword things out there these days on mindfulness, but that wasn't always the case when it was first um, described. And the way it's really described to begin is as a way of paying attention in the moment on purpose. So the on purpose is key in a particular way and without judgment. And so the particular way is with a sense of curiosity and not judgment. So an example would be having something happen and paying attention to your feelings and your body reaction on purpose. So you're making it a point to pay attention. It's not like watching a TV show where you're paying attention to the TV show but you're paying attention on purpose with awareness and without judgment. And so that's the basic definition of what it is, just to begin. What is the connection between mindfulness and resilience? Because these words are often used together. Yeah, I mean, mindfulness is a skill and it's a felt sense skill. And it's sort of a skill that you develop over time, you can gain it or lose it, but it's central to resilience. So there's also many definitions of resilience. One of them is to be able to stay calm and in control when faced with a challenge. Instead of shutting down and or acting out beyond what the issue is. It's also defined as being able to stay connected and awake and aware in the face of uncertainty or stress so that you can really bring all of your intelligence and emotional self to the situation versus having to shut down or try to just protect and push away. So this um, issue of resilience is bigger than mindfulness, but in order to have resilience, you need that capacity to be able to recognize that you might be becoming stressed or that something's happening that's dysregulating you, let's say, so that when you're not resilient, you're not regulated, able to regulate your nervous system, your breathing, your emotions, something is very stimulated. So mindfulness is a skill that is central to being able to stay calm and in control when faced with challenges, to be able to stay present and in a problem-solving mode, and in an aware, connected mode to the people around you when things are hard, which is a lot of how we think of resilience. A lot of your research looks at the impacts of what are called adverse childhood experiences. So tell us about what these are and how resilience and mindfulness can help. Okay, yeah. So adverse childhood experiences derives from a study that done by the CDC originally, where it was noticed that people who weren't really recovering after intensive programs of weight reduction was how it originally started, weren't recovering, they had success and then they reverted. And so they asked them a lot of questions about their history, trying to really pick apart why that might be. And what they found was a history of a lot of people having sexual abuse, having alcoholism in the home, emotional abuse, feeling unconnected to in the home. And so really ACEs became a concept that represents the things that can happen that break the sense of safety and stability and nurturing connection between children and those that are their caregivers. That's the most basic piece. So the events, the experiences, because they have to be experienced, 
okay, this is about experiences, is physical and emotional and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, which is different, and emotional neglect being a very important adverse childhood experience that many people ignore. And then also having household dysfunctions like um, untreated mental health problems or suicidality in a parent, um, ment- uh, medical um, issues that are untreated that create a disability and an ability for a family member to take care of their child, but also substance abuse of any kind, alcoholism or substance abuse, and those sorts of things. So dysfunction, also incarcerated parent, losing a parent to death, incarceration, or divorce and separation. That's, that's studied a lot, but losing parents really is a big deal for kids if it's not regulated. Again, this sort of, a, when things happen like that, if there are events that are coming and going, you can help a child. So that's what they are. And some people also include things like food insecurity and being bullied at school. And those are also important, but the science is very clear that it's the disruptions to the intimate family relationships and that sense of safety in your primary household and primary caregiver relationships that is the most impactful. And so basically what happens is healthy attachment and healthy um, development of the brain of a person and their ability to stay self-regulated or gain those skills really comes through feeling um, connected in a safe way to your primary attachment figures, your mom, your dad, your whoever is your parent or serving as your parent. And when that doesn't happen, you can lose the ability to really have be have self-regulation or have resilience. It can prevent um, healthy cognitive functioning, social functioning. So we see children with multiple adverse childhood experiences being two, three, four times more likely to have mental health problems or not be engaged in school, not be able to be self-regulated themselves. And it's a direct function of, in some ways, having a, a mindful attachment relationship. So mindfulness, relational mindfulness in many ways, is what attachment is. So we're mindful together on purpose, being present together on purpose. What do ACEs look like as, you know, what does the impact look like on children as they get older and what can help heal? Absolutely. So one thing to know is that most children who are exposed to ACEs don't go on to have big health problems, but the likelihood that they do is many, many times greater if a child has ACEs. And that really starts to show up early. So if we did early assessments, we would see it. And it really, um, if early, we can get connected to children, help them notice the, the experience that they had, help them develop meaning, make meaning and sense out of what happens so it doesn't become a self-blame issue, get them into a safe environment, hopefully address any issues in the family. It won't go on necessarily to have big impacts. But a lot of children with ACEs, it's lifelong and they don't know what happened to them and then they end up not engaging in school. That's one of the first ways it shows up is lack of engagement in school or hypervigilance of being perfect and having an intolerance for not having certainty. So it can be hypervigilance or kind of not being very engaged. It's that getting stuck on off or stuck on on. And also a lot more diagnosis of mental, emotional, behavioral problems. And we see very, very strong connections with children with two or more ACEs in their history being, you know, two and a half, almost three times more likely of having a mental, emotional, behavioral diagnosis. And if you look at the symptoms of trauma, a toxic stress and trauma, which can be a result of ACEs when they're not addressed, when they happen and and the child is helped, that they're very similar to the symptoms of depression or anxiety. And so there's something called developmental trauma disorder. And a lot of the symptoms that we label with mental health problems and then often medicate kids for often happen without recognizing that they have their carrying trauma and toxic stress and need to learn to heal. So honestly, most of the approaches to help children heal do involve getting them connected to their body in a way that feels safe, where they can start to feel their own emotions and their body in a safe place. And sometimes that will bring up older feelings, and it depends on the developmental nature of the child. But a lot of the activities and technologies that are being used really have to do with art, like drawing, art, and, you know, or theater, 
or movement and yoga and things that can help bring us into our body in a safe way and then actually be able to tell our stories and be heard and make meaning out of our experiences, start to see some of the patterns that have happened. Okay, I don't trust people or I trust people too much and I don't have boundaries. These are both very common outpicturing of trauma. They can go either way. People really block people out, again, that numbing or stuck on on. They're too open, too active, no boundaries. And so then seeing all that in a space of mindfulness where you're not judgmental, you're able to be able to see what's happening in you on purpose without judgment and stay connected to yourself while you explore what arises emotionally and in your thought process. So mindfulness-based strategies are definitely the center of all of these healing modalities. But the healing modalities depend on the developmental level of the child, how safe they feel. And the first step is safety. Safety in the body and safety relationally with whoever is working with them. And there's a lot children can do and youth can do on their own just to become embodied, if that makes sense. My next question was actually going to be, where are these safe spaces and and who is best positioned to be doing this work with children? Yeah. I mean, I think what's really important is it's through any door because any adult that can be present with a child in a safe way is a healing force for a child. And so we all matter way more than we think. And it could be a bus driver. It could be anyone. So for all of us to realize how we are with children, to see them. In, in a way that they feel safe. And so we all know when a child feels safe or not, so you don't want to come in. So I do think we all have a role, but in schools, there's practices like mindful mindfulness practices and ways that children can self-reflect. And if they've had something happen that's hard, um, there's safe ways to help them understand that there's supports for them. And because it's so prevalent in certain communities, there's actually you know programs that teach children self-regulation skills and a knowledge like psychological knowledge about understanding themselves. And if they do things, they don't understand why they do them, that it might come from something that happened to them and that it's not their fault. And so definitely schools and also healthcare. So children are meant to go in for healthcare lots of times when they're really young, but as teens and young adults on their own. So there's a lot more movement now to doing trauma-informed care in healthcare where there's a real a more formal assessment of what the impacts have been and whether it's just sort of educational and self-care techniques and getting into certain situations where you can start some of these practices and reading or whether there's something that's needed more like counseling and that sort of thing. So it's, it depends on whether it's exposure that's that sort of secondary trauma or it's like in the secondary prevention area or whether it needs formal treatment. And it really, there's a lot that is available right now for kids and youth to to be accessing. A theme here seems to be, because you talked about mindfulness with parenting, you know, and, and being mindful together. And then you talked about how all of us have a role in that. What What is this collective mindfulness? What does that look like? Yeah. So collective mindfulness, relational mindfulness is really actually very similar to the felt sense that a child gets and a parent mother gets as well and a, or a parent gets when they actually are reg- co-regulating, that's creating that healthy attachment. And so it's a co-regulatory process where we're attuned to each other. And we know we're attuned to each other because we can feel it in our bodies. And there can even be a sense of a little bit of a loss of time where you're actually, you know, you can start to feel your attuning in that way. So one version of collective mindfulness is really relational mindfulness, relational connection, where I consciously and on purpose try to connect with you in a way where I can tell that you can tell that I'm connected to you. It's like, I see you, can see that I see you. And you can see that I can see that you see me. And it's literally like feeling seen and knowing that you feel seen mutually. And that's a really important place to go because so much intelligence and healing opens up inside of that. It's not easy if you, if connection was so scary when you were younger with ACEs. So it's not a small thing to achieve, 
So I also want to say, though, there is a formal collective uh, mindfulness definition that's actually for organizations and businesses that says for, you know, so there's a lot of medical errors, for example, and the common denominator recommendation by the, what's called the Joint Commission for Healthcare Organizations, they accredit all healthcare. They basically say the core skill to give excellent healthcare is collective mindfulness, which is the capacity of a team of people, let's say in a surgery area, being able to be conscious of the moment and what's happening. They call it, you know, being attuned to situational awareness, you know, being able to stay attentive in common processes where you don't just, you know, get into habitual mode. You stay aware, even if you're doing something that you've done a hundred times. And so there's a definition of collective mindfulness that's also very centered in what makes up an excellent high reliability organization. So the concept really does play all the way through from the attachment relationship to how do we work together in teams to create excellence in our caring for people in healthcare or flying the plane. <laughs> that's important too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this really sounds like, you know, it, it sounds a little bit counter to just how I think most people see their lives on the day to day. Like it, it feels like something when you're talking about, you know, to me, it sounds like slow down, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of like multitasking things are coming at you. The world is very chaotic. There, there's so much going on and people, I think, tend to think of, of mindfulness as something that requires you to like take hours and hours of classes and, and, you know, meditation or becoming a yogi, but you're saying this is a skill that can be built into the day to day. So can you talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it is important to do some practice, especially at the beginning, because it does build up a skill that then you're doing it more automatically. And so mindfulness in the marketplace is what it's all about, right? Being able to do this day by day. If you look at it, think about a film, you're t- if you take a film, it's actually a collection of single pictures all together. So it's like, like single pictures all together look like it's movement, right? And so in mindfulness, you are present now and now and now and now. Right. And so there may be a lot of nows, but it becomes more of a habit to stay connected. And it really anchors back to connecting with your body and your breath and having that almost unconscious, habituated ability to stay connected and self regulate even when you're not trying to. And because it does become a habit, it is a skill and you can lose it and gain it. And the practices, especially in the beginning, are very important because it is something that we're not used to doing and we might be dysregulated, but it really is something you can do any moment, just like noticing your feet on the ground or counting three things you can see or taking one conscious breath or going to get a glass of water and really feeling it go down your throat. These things actually start to reset your ability to self-regulate moment by moment with each moment going fast, but they all add up. So I don't know if that helps a little bit without going on for too long, but it needs to become a habit and then it becomes a habit and it's not about going away and slowing down. Is there something we can try here for our listeners? Yeah. I mean, I'm tempted to, there's, there's one exercise I may not, we may not have time, but it's called, um, it's really about coming to your senses. So mindfulness isn't leaving at all. In fact, I had somebody take a mindfulness class with me and they had to take it again because the whole time they were trying not to think. And it's like, it's not about becoming mindless. It's about mindfulness where you're aware of what is there and you're not trying to change it. You're becoming related to your thoughts, your emotions, your senses, and realizing that there is like this wheel of awareness exercise where you just take a moment and you think, well, what am I, what am I thinking? And maybe there's something that's happening in your life and you just say, well, what do I, what are the thoughts I have about it? And then what are the feelings that I have about it? And what are the body sensations I notice when I think about it? And what are the reactions that I want to have? Like, what do I really like impulsively feel like I should do? And then what will I choose? And to break down the process of how things happen and we have thoughts and feelings and sensations and reactions And with the awareness of mindfulness, we can actually put ourselves into the intentional response mode 
versus the reaction mode. So there's exercises like the wheel of awareness that I really recommend people look up and there's many of them. Those are very powerful, but just for an exercise for right now, maybe we could do something like um, box breathing, which is a really good one where you just breathe in for four, hold your breath for four, breathe out for four and hold your breath for four, but do it in a way where you're really being very present with the sensations that you feel. So that would just be, um, if you want to start just breathing in for four, one, two, three, four, holding for four, three, four, out for four, three, four, and then in for four. And if you just do that a few times, you start to feel more regulated. Part of what it's doing, just so people know, is it's helping to tone the polyvagal nerve. So when you hold the breath, it helps activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And it helps you to calm your body, deep belly breathing for one minute where you really breathe in and hold it for as long as you can, 15 seconds even, and then slowly breathing out like two or three times really activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And that brings you in to a sense of your body. And so much of the time we're not breathing. So I would really recommend those breathing exercises. So maybe for our starting to, to build the skill a little bit, we just breathe. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But it's surprising how much we don't. And, and then the nervous system can get stuck on, on to a point where then it shuts down and then we have seek numbing behavior And this is a cycle that most people can notice, you know, I'm overactivated and then I need to numb versus being present. And how do we stay in that regulated window of tolerance to our experience? And when we've had trauma in our lives, it really can be hard to do that. And so we need a lot of self-compassion, but know that with some support and exercises and really self-compassion that it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you we can really activate a lot of healing and bring people into current time where they can really be happy and joyful again. Christina Bethel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes Fernandez and Amber Bryan Singletary. Thank you for listening.